Good, good. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Simon's Electronic Coffee Center's EM course. Today we're going to be talking about micro EEG and 3D crystallography. So I mentioned that there's a lot of modalities of EM that are not new, uh, and but it's just until recent days and recent years that we've been able to extend the capability of a transmission electron microscope not only to do single particle and tomography, but what we're talking about today and using microcrystals. Our lecturer today is Bill Rice. He has joint appointments at the Cell Biology Department and Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology Departments at NYU. More importantly, he's also the NYU core. And a lot of technology developments we're talking about, let's say routine ice thickness during data collection and a lot of these developments, Bill actually has a paper on that. So after the lecture, if you're curious about what we're talking about during the sample prep lecture, you can also bring that up after. So without further ado, Bill. Oh, thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, micro ED and then a little bit also about 2D, start with a little bit about 2D crystallography, which is kind of an older technique, but uh, was actually the first technique that, that kind of worked pretty well for cryo EM. Um, so these are the main, I guess, the four modalities of cryo EM that are kind of in use or have been in use, so there's tomo which we're, and they're all going to be covered in this course. So there's tomography, um, single particle, um, 2D electron crystallography, and then microelectron diffraction. So um, tomography is probably the, the lowest resolution one, but that's the only one that can give you parts of cells or, or, or large areas or of cells and, and kind of get everything in their context. But, and with sub-tomogram sub averaging, you can get down to maybe three to 10 angstroms, depending on how things are. Um, so it, it, it can be a reasonably high resolution technique with, with sub-tomogram averaging, which will be covered in other lectures. Single particle resolution is the most popular one right now. Um, so it, it has got as good as 1.5 angstrom. That's certainly not typical. Um, typical probably is more in the, I guess the low three angstrom range is what most people are aiming for now. Uh, but it's very, I would say most of the structures coming out now are, are single particle reconstruction. And there's the 2D electron crystallography. It, it's gotten as good as 1.9 angstrom resolution. Um, but it was kind of, as I'll talk to you, it's a little more, quite a bit more difficult and involved to, to do. And then micro ED is the one, is a technique which actually gives the highest resolution. It gives, you can actually get sub angstrom resolution for small molecules and, and small peptides and things like that. Um, so it actually is the only one that, you know, we always talk about near atomic resolution, and this one actually is giving atomic resolution. Um, so first of all, 2D crystallography. So that was the first kind of high resolution cryo EM method and is generally mostly uh, for, for membrane proteins. And so from this uh, review from 2011, these were the main uh, proteins where people, where different groups were able to actually solve, a, get a map good enough to be able to, be able to fit a molecular model and update it and generally upload it to the, the PDB. So the earliest one was, was, for, for, was Henderson et al. They did, a, about a, I think it was about a six angstrom structure of bacteria or Dobson. And um, basically, they were able to, it was quite exciting at the time, 1990. So that's now 30 years ago, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and then in, in, the, in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s, other proteins came out, light harvesting con complex, uh, aquaporins, uh, glutathione transferase, um, different pumps, um, tra and transporters. Um, the acetylcholine receptor, actually this one is kind of a, it's a bit of an outlier in this one because this, this was actually solved by helical reconstruction of, which is kind of a different, similar technique, but a little bit different. You're going to be hearing about the helical next week. But all of these were sort of the early, early really strong success stories of, of EM to get re high, high, reasonably high resolution structures. Um, but it was a challenging technique. Like I said, it was generally used for membrane proteins, so because they sort of, when, when a protein is in a bilayer, it kind of naturally, if it forms an array inside the bilayer, that's kind of a, it's like a 2D crystal. It's like, it's, even though it's a 3D molecule, it's ordered in two dimensions along the, the, the you know, say the, the length of the bilayer, and so that, that's why it's called a 2D crystal. But in order to do it, it was quite, I would say, challenging and, and, and laborious to actually do it. So what you had to do was purify your membrane protein, uh, remove most of the detergent, and then have it inserted into a bilayer. So generally what you do is, like in, in A and B are the most common methods of doing it, where you have your protein, your, your, your membrane protein purified and hopefully in an active state, and then you would add some lipid to it, which is also sol solubilized in detergent, and then either in A you'd put it in a little dialysis button, which holds about, you know, maybe 20 to 50 microliters, depending on the button size, 
and then put a little you know, semi-permeable membrane over, over the hole in the button, and then you drop it into your solution to dialyze it out. The, over a period of days, the detergent dialyzes out, and, the, and the, you know, the, the, the lipid you added forms some, some little lipid micelles, and the protein gets inserted into the lipid bilayer and hopefully concentrates and crystallizes. Um, in B, there's the other technique to, I guess, standard dialysis technique is instead of using these little buttons, if you have a lot of protein, you can use a dialysis bag and actually use that, but that, that took a lot more protein. So generally, I would say buttons are more popular to do it. Um, and so that was very, like I said, very laborious. For every condition you wanted to try, you had to have a different solution. And so you could have, you know, even if you, if you wanted to do eight or 10 trials, that would be eight or 10 buttons or, or, you know, if you're dialyzing into different solutions or different buffers, you'd have to set all this up and then you'd have to screen it afterwards. So it's qu it quite a bit of work. Um, I would say in the 2000s, they, you know, we started to try to get some high throughput methods. So they developed a nine, one way was to develop a 96 well dialysis block where this, where you could then set up 96 sets of proteins or 96 sets of solutions and dialyze into different ones and then screen them. And at least it was a little bit more compact. I mean, you can't really imagine having 96 beakers of, of stuff dialyzing. Uh, and then they also, another way to remove the detergent is to add a, a solution, a chemical called cyclodextran. And so cyclodextran basically binds detergent. So you, could, you can kind of add a little bit of cyclodextran over time to your, um, to your solution and it will bind the detergent and then that will sort of sequester the detergent away from the lipid and then you can get into micelles that way. And so that, the purpose of using that mainly was to, was to be able, so that a robot could be set up. And the robot would basically add different, amount, different cyclo, cyclodextrin to different solutions and you could then set up again an array of, 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 of screening conditions in order to, in order to get crystals. Um, but this all, to be honest, we, we actually had this robot here. It never really worked very well. It was whoever used it never wanted to use it again. It was very difficult. <laughs> Um, and then, so, so once you d did all did that, and you actually have have your protein in a in a uh, lipid in a lipid bilayer, you then have to screen it. And so, basically, what you generally do is first of all screen by negative stain. So, you, for every solution, you have to put it onto a regular EM grid and then screen it, and then kind of screen around the grid for conditions. And you might see, you know, when you're very lucky, your aim is to see a crystalline lattice, but you might just see sheets or empty liposomes or aggregated junk or all precipitation, all sorts of things. And, but your, your goal was to see something like this, which was your, your protein kind of inserted into, the, into a into membrane and hopefully it would form a crystalline lattice. Um, but again, this, the screening was, could be quite laborious. And again, high throughput methods were set up, I guess, you know, around 2006 and onwards. Uh, for for uh, high for sort of high throughput screening and there was actually a robot here that helped people do it uh, and that would actually sort of screen through a whole bunch of grids and go through the several days on the on the 1230 microscope downstairs and it would sort of it used actually the, the software called legend on in order to, in order to, um, to 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 see things and but ideally you would have you know if you had a, a 2d 2d um, crystal and it formed a it formed a nice array. It was, it was quite easy then to get a projection map and you would see something like this where you could then calculate a projection map through your molecule and you would, you would actually sort of st start to see the, the beginnings of, of the shape of it. Um, so then once you had screened for conditions that, that actually form crystals, you had to then do, put it into cryo conditions and then look at it again and, and under, under cryo this time. And so this is an example of a, what was done for the aquaporin channel, which actually went to the highest resolution. This was, this was Tamir Gonin's uh, work. And so he, he went to about 1.9 angstrom with it, but this is what a, a 2D crystal looks like when, it, when it's sort of frozen. And then if you, this is in B is a sort of blown up area of this little square. And, and you, can ki you can't really see the lattice of it, but you can kind of see there's something in there. But if you do the, if you calculate the Fourier transform of it, which I think was covered last week, right? Correct. So if you calculate the Fourier transform of it, you can see, you could see um, little, you could see little spots, which are the, the diffraction spots from the effects, effectively the lattice of the of the crystal. And if you look at if you look at this, you can see that the, the spots go out pretty far towards the edge. And so the, the, at the, in this Fourier transform of it, this the, the center part is the low resolution region, and then the the edges of this are the high resolution. And so the, the spots are going out to fairly high resolution. So that means this one would be a, a good candidate for, for further analysis. 
Um, this, is, this is not a direct diffraction pattern, but this is actually calculated Fourier transform of the image, and you can sort of kind of tell that there's, a, there's the, you can see the tone rings of it. Um, so if you, um, what you would have to do then is sort of screen your 2D crystals, and the, the thing is they have to be perfectly flat. So you have your crystal that's, you've added it to an EM grid and blotted off most of the water. Um, you, there are two, a couple ways of doing it. Um, the, the older way, or the more traditional way, was to actually um, add a bit of sugar solution to it, like trehalose was generally used, and then you'd sort of freeze that down. You'd sort of dry it in trehalose, so the trehalose would sort of let you freeze it and get rid of most of the water, and you wouldn't actually have to do what's the traditional cryo freezing, where you have to freeze so fast that you, that you, the, the, the ice doesn't form crystals, but you would actually add tree halos to it to sort of preserve it and like leave a layer of it on it, and then you could freeze it afterwards, either in the microscope or or by or just in liquid nitrogen. Um, but anyway, you would freeze it and then look for for very flat crystals. The crystals has to be flat because any sort of bump in the crystal would kind of mean there's a distortion in the 2D lattice, and you're, and you're sort of relying on this 2D lattice in order to, um, in order to, to, to get a good reconstruction. So in, in A is a, is a, is a sort of a, a bad, doubly bad crystal where it wasn't very well preserved, and it was sort of also not very flat. You, it wasn't very well, the reason you can, it wasn't very well preserved is because the, the diffraction spots, these are, and these are collected, these are diffraction images that were collected. But the, the reason it wasn't very well preserved was because the, um, the, the spots don't go out very far. And the, because the crystal was kind of bent, that meant it was sort of disordered in one direction. So the spots go out a little bit further in this direction than in, than in this direction. Um, in, in B is a, is a sample of one where it, it's, it's, it's not very well preserved, but it is sort of more homogeneous. It's going out, in, it's, so it's flat. It's, it is a flat crystal. It's going out in the same, more or less the same to the same extent in all directions, but it's just not going very far. In C is one where there, it's going out, it's, re, it's well preserved, so it's going, it's, it's going out pretty far, but it's, it's kind of better in one direction than the other. And then in, in, in D is, is one where it's, um, it's actually a, kind of the ideal crystal, where it's, it's going out very well in all directions, and it's, um, it's, it's, very, it's a well preserved crystal. The spots are very sharp, in all, even all the way up to high resolution in all directions. Um, and so it was also, um, you, you, and this is, a, I'm, this is the sort of protocol for setting up for 2D manual collection that you, that you had to do, is you sort of have to set up a diff, what's called diffraction mode of the microscope. I'll go on into that a little bit later, but you'd, you'd kind of have to do all of this manual stuff where you'd, you'd, you'd first of all align the, make sure that it's well aligned in diffraction mode, and then you'd sort of set it up in, in, into an over-focused mode so that you would you, you put it in diffraction mode and then you move the focus point far away from it and that kind of gives you a defocused image at a very low dose so you can actually use this sort of low defo this defocused image to sort of find your crystals and find your areas and then you'd set up a focus mode a little bit away from the part that you'd actually want to image and 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 define where and use that area to sort of define put it into focus and also define what the eucentric height of it is the eccentric height is where basically the point in the microscope where if you tilt it, it doesn't move. Whereas if it's at the wrong height, it, if you tilt it, it kind of swings around. So you want to be at this defined eccentric height always. Um, you then have to set up sort of exposure mode, and you set it set up to a fairly low mag, say 15,000 X or something, so that you're covering a good part of the crystal. And then you go to diffraction mode, and then you sort of have to adjust things, which I'll get, describe it a little bit later, so that the diffraction mode is the way you want it. And then, for, and then once that's all set up, you can then cycle between these three modes, the search, focus, and exposure mode. So you go into search mode, find a crystal, um, put in a selected area aperture to sort, of sent, to sort of minimize your field of view to that crystal, put in a beam stop. Um, this is the beam stop here, so it sort of blocks out the center part of the beam so that you don't burn your camera or, or oversaturate your film if you were taking on film. And then basically you then have to set up diffraction mode. You, you, you find it, take a picture, take a diffraction picture, and then either tilt, tilt it or, or go on to another crystal. But anyway, it was quite, it was quite laborious to do all of this. Uh, and then for the, once you did collect all the, you know, your, your images, the software also was, was not exactly easy to use. Um, it used to be always be these old um, Fortran scripts, and so you'd have to edit these scripts and all that. In the 
sometime in the 2000s, they came up with this pro, uh, nice graphical interface called 2DX, which lets you, which let you sort of have an interface in order to process your 2D data and kind of, you know, you'd have to index your diffraction pattern and and decide which micrographs are good. And if you're doing imaging, and, and then you'd have to determine the CTF of everything. Uh, it had a quite quite a complicated interface in order to, to do all this, but it did let you do everything at least. Um, I don't know how many of you have used RelyOn and thought that was complicated, but this was compared to that, this was really complicated, I think. Um, but anyway, it was it was it, it did work. It let you do a lot of 2D stuff. Um, in in years past, in this course, we actually used to have a one day long um, workshop where we actually some we would actually have people merge or at least do 2D some 2D analysis of 2D crystals and actually work through this program in order to get a at least a, um, a density map, like a, a two-dimensional density map through a, through a crystalline protein. Um, but we sort of have stopped doing that because no one, not many people are doing 2D anymore, um, mainly because it was so difficult and, and things have, along, have moved on. So ag again, the, there were a lot of main difficulties. It was, screening was quite hard, setting up conditions, screening one by one was very, took a long time, even, even with some automation. And there's also, when you think about it, there's a huge sort of factorial surface in order to search because it's, you know, for 3D crystallography, you have to search a whole bunch of conditions because you have to search, you know, your, you have your protein, but then you have all these additives and there are, you know, hundreds of additives you can try. In this, not only are there the buffer and additive conditions, but you also have to have the screen for lipid and different detergents and even the speed of detergent removal. So it was just kind of incredibly hard. Um, it, there were, most of the labs who were doing it were pretty hardcore EM labs, and you know these would be decade-long projects to get a to get a structure. And, and even once you did it, you know you had to, your samples had to be really well, really flat and, and very well ordered. You had to, in order to do the collection, you had to merge crystals at different tilts in order to get 3D reconstructions. Because when if you think about it, when your 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 first picture you take is through a, a 2D crystal, you're getting a, just a direct projection through that crystal. In order to get 3D information, you have to tilt it in order to, to fill in Fourier space to get different views of that crystal. And so then it was kind of, in a way, it's kind of like tomography that way. You had to sort of do all of that. And it was quite hard to do and manual. Um, software also was quite, quite difficult. So once, you know, 2D, you know, while this was being developed, um, Single particle was also, you know, moving along, and then once single particle really started to work, once the detectors were up to speed, um, that was sort of it for, for most of, two, for the most part, for 2D crystallography. But um, it turns out that actually, you, around the same time that um, that single particle started to work really well, this other technique called MicroED also started to work, where instead of looking at 2D crystals. Um, people were looking at very, very tiny 3D crystals that were actually too small to look at for, um, for, um, for, for X-ray crystallography. Um, these are, you know, micron or submicron sized crystals. Now, um, and in then 2018, kind of more people kind of, when it was started to be applied to just small molecules and not just proteins, it was suddenly kind of this revelation, hey, we could have been doing this all the time, and this actually works really well. It could be really, really fast technique for sort of small molecule structures. Um, so for, for microED, um, it's been around since about 2013. There have been, I don't know, about a dozen or so structures solved by it, I would say, in, in terms of proteins. Um, you know, catalase, lysozyme, proteinase K, these were kind of trips, and these are all sort of, um, easy targets, sort of, but this sort of a proof of concept that actually it can work. Um, but what's been more interesting, actually, I think, is, is these sort of small molecules or small peptides, uh, which actually have, have, come, have come to um, very, very high resolution. And these ones are sort of, are, are sort of more novel structures versus the, the proteins, which are sort of have, were solved already, but sort of just kind of proving, proving that it, it can work. Um, if you look in the EMDB, I didn't look at it this year, but when I looked at it last year, um, there's a total of about 69 um, structures that were solved by uh, microED. There was a big boost in 2018 when those people started, look, started submitting these small molecules and small peptides, especially. Um, if you look at the EMDB statistics, uh, again, these are about a year old, but it's probably quite similar nowadays. Uh, so single particle was the, the mass, vast majority of the, of the deposited maps, almost, 70, almost three quarters of it. 
um, subtile gram averaging another 10%, and then just standard tomography, almost 10%. And then helical, which is going to be covered next week, is at least sizable, and, but electron crystallography is pretty small. It's only about 1%. And about half of these were micro ED. So there aren't too many maps by 2D crystallography, and the micro ED was already catching up quite a bit. Um, there was also, a, you know, the, 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 uh, the idea of micro ED is you can actually get, you know, um, structures from so-called invisible crystals, where someone set up a crystal trial of their protein or their peptide, and the crystals were so small they couldn't really be seen by eye or, you know, by standard technique, but then when you put this sort of dust on, onto an EM grid that you, or a sort of cloud of tiny precipitate onto an EM grid, it was possible to see these tiny crystals and use these tiny 3D crystals in order to, to calculate um, structures. And this was also, I mean, it also worked well, very well for amyloid core. That also was another sample of something that went to high resolution. Um, so I'll, but I'll sort of segue just a little bit into X-ray crystallography because this is, in a way, the micro ED is very much similar to, to X-ray crystallography, but instead of using X-rays, you're using electrons. Um, so for, I'm not going to go into very much. I mean, you, I don't know how many of you, are many of you crystallographers already? Some of you. Okay, so, that's, so if you are, you, you'll know this very well. But the idea is for, for X-ray is you have a, it's kind of a 3D lattice of your protein, and you have a, a beam that hits it at some angle and then bounces off it at another angle theta, and you get cons sort of constructive interference only when sort of the path length between these two rays are the same. They're in phase, that keeps them in phase, and there's this equation n lambda equals 2d sine theta. And you'll sort of always assume there's only one scattering event. There's no multiple scatterings. Um, but you can, from, from basically from collecting a, a diffraction pattern of an X-ray beam hitting, hitting the, the crystal, you, you, get, you, get all, you see all these spots. And from these spots, you, you, can, calcula you can calculate a, um, a, a 3D structure. So what you have to do is you mount, you mount a crystal. You, you, you make a crystal of your protein, which is the hard part. Goes into an X-ray beam at a defined wavelength, usually at a synchrotron nowadays. Collect some ref images of reflections on a detector, um, and then you rotate the crystal uh, while basically while you're collecting, so you get all the reflections. And then from these positions, you can get 3D lattice parameters. But one important thing is when you collect the sort of diffraction experiment, you're only collecting the the intensities of of the of the reflection. So the when you basically all of these these um, points when it gets reflected it has an amplitude and a phase but you're not you can't collect the phase of the electron you can only collect the amplitude uh, you actually collect the intensity which is amplitude squared but you then have to play some tricks in order to get what the actual phases are uh, of all of these spots and so there's different ways which is you know if you have a very small very small molecule or or and it goes to very high resolution you can, you can use what's called ab initio methods which is to sort of use these the intensity of these, of these spots is sort of solve it from scratch. Um, that doesn't actually probably work for most proteins. They're too big, and, the, and spots don't go to high enough resolution. But for small things, it can work. Uh, or you know, what used to be used, what's commonly used still is, is heavy atom derivatives, where you add, add some sort of lead or, or, diff, or, or um, heavy metal to it. And it's scat you, basically, from its scattering pattern, you can kind of get the phases from it and then work your way back to, to the phases of your protein. Or there's the mad anomalous scattering techniques, where where you sort of look at sort of different ed edge scattering of, of 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 selenium on it, and it basically you can sort of get the phases that way. Or you know there's all if you have a if you don't have the structure of your protein, but you have a structure of something that's reasonably similar, you can use what's called molecular replacement to get the phases, which is you um, basically use use a, a similar protein as a starting point and calculate kind of what the phases of it would be if it was in this crystal. And then that use that to give you a starting point for an estimate of the phases. And then the software will sort of work its way through to sort of determine what the phases actually are and give you a structure. Um, if you remember from the, the Fourier transform part, if you calculate the Fourier transform of an image, you have amplitudes and phases. The amplitudes are sort of the, are the intensity of the spots, and the phases are, if you calculate it, you have the phases of it. And the phases are actually what gives, gives you the structure. The amplitude doesn't really give you the structure, but the, it, the structure is kind of in the phases. They may have shown a picture where if you, um, if, you swap, if you take two pictures and you calculate the Fourier transform of each, and you take the phases of one and the, ampli and the amplitude of the other, 
the image, the, where you took the phases from kind of gives you what the, what the inverse transform of it was. Um, so the, again, the, the main thing is you have to, you're, you're collecting just amplitude data and you have to calculate the phases. Um, you also always, in x-ray diffraction, you have a beam stop. So in, when the x-ray beam is, this is a highly focused x-ray beam and it's going through your crystal, most of it is not interacting with the crystal itself. It's just shooting straight through. And so that would very quickly damage the dete whatever detector you're using. So you put what's called a beam stop in to sort of block the, the, the zero point of it, or the sort of the DC point of, of the transform in, in one way of saying it. It's, it's sort of, you know, so that you don't, the, the direct beam gets blocked. Um, another thing is with the, if you look at the, at this, at the diffraction pattern of it, uh, you know, sort of, you would sort of naively or, you know, I, I naturally think that, you know, since it's some sort of regular sort of squarish lattice, you would expect a sort of regular squarish pattern. But you, when you look at the, at the diffraction pattern that's collected, you actually, you can kind of see it's following all of these curves. It's not really straight, straight lines. You're, there are straight lines in it from the lattice, but you sort of see these curves of, of density that are, that are actually being collected instead of straight lines. And, and that's because of, of what's called the Ewald sphere, which is sort of like a, a construct of, of what is, of the data which is actually collected. So if you take, the, inco the incoming x-ray beam has a certain wavelength called lambda. So if, you know, around your sort of crystal point, you, you draw a sphere of wavelength one over lambda, the inverse of the wavelength of it, the, in, it's sort of an inverse space. If you then overlay that with sort of the, lat the, the lattice of the transform of your protein, the sort of the, the inverse space lattice of your protein, um, the only points that you actually collect are where this, where this sphere interacts with, sort of the surface of the sphere touches the, these lattice points. So, it, so in this case, if this is the inverse lattice of the protein, you actually will only collect the, in this case, the one, the zero, 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 the one, zero, one, and this one, which is the zero, zero, minus one, or something like that. But you'd only collect these points and not all of these other points until you rotate the crystal. And then when you, when you rotate the crystal, you sort of collect a different set of points. And so if you rotate it in 2D around this whole 360 degree circle, you would actually sweep out this entire yellow area of points. And so, but each one would, you'd only be getting certain these, these, these sort of curved points. So that's why you, you only see these, because of this Ewald sphere construction, you only sort of see certain points and only, and only these points are collected at a certain um, angle of, of incidence for your crystal. Um, so as again, uh, X-ray crystallography ha does have limits. Um, that's why we're doing EM. Um, so about 30% of proteins seem to not be able to crystallize. A lot of them are membrane proteins because you know, they're usually in detergents or they're floppy and they're just hard to do. Uh, or they, maybe they form crystals, but they're just too small to be able to mount and put into a, into a, into a synchrotron beam even. Um, there's there's XFEL, X-free electron laser, which you, can, which, 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 which you can use to sort of you look at very small crystals, but that's extremely expensive and you need many ex crystals and it's not really commonly used yet. Um, but this is this. If you have tiny, tiny crystals, XFEL would be one way of doing it. If you have many of them. Um, so, getting back to, to the wavelengths a little bit, the, wa the wavelength of X-rays is around 70 uh, picometers or, or 150 picometers for copper, which is more commonly used. Um, but for um, EM, the wavelengths are much, much smaller, about 1 50th the size. So, generally, we're, we're you know we're operating around 200 kV or 300 kV, except for the low-end screening scopes. So. You know the, the 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 wavelength of electrons is around two to two and a half picometers, so it's really really small wavelength of electrons. So it's much 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 smaller than the than the wavelength of a of an X-ray. Now, so again, to, to move back into into EM and and, and micro ED, uh, this was sort of started in 2013 with this paper where they did three-dimensional electron crystallography of microcrystals. So they had these. This was this was this was just lysozyme where they made crystals of it. This is a light micrograph of the of the crystals they see. So the large crystals that you see here, these would be these are not the crystals that you use for microED. These ones would be used for X-ray crystallography. 
Um, but the, they also, in, in this mixture of, 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 crystal, of crystal and crystals that they made of lysozyme, there are these tiny, tiny crystals which are sort of pointed at by these arrows, and they look like just little dots. But if you took, take these tiny, tiny crystals and put them on a on a on a cryo on a micro on an EM grid and freeze it, you can actually you can then see them at, at, at low mag on the EM. And so this is on a kind of a, one of our standard quantifoil grids that people use. So this is a probably a two micron hole roughly. Um, I'm not sure you can see the hole, but from here to here is about two microns. And then this is one of these tiny micro crystals that they can. They, they, you, you, this is actually a, a little three D crystal that you could use to do um, to to do to to collect mi micro electron diffraction patterns from to do a three D reconstruction. Um, so the idea is basically you you take diffraction images of your crystal, and in the original implementation, they they sort of took in, took it took individual images at at various tilts. And then, um, and then um, did, did use this to sort of, and with some little modifications to, to do a 3D reconstruction using kind of standard um, X-ray software. So they first of all solved lysozyme at, at 2.9 angstrom resolution. Um, when they were doing this, they also looked at how much dose each of the the, the, the diffraction spots could take could 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 take until it sort of disappeared. And so, and they they. Basically, this, this is looking at one of the. This is a looking at an individual s diffraction spot, its intensity, uh, after giving it a certain amount of electron dose, and so at, at the beginning it, it has a relative intensity. Where'd my mouse go? Oh, it has a relative intensity of one, and then this is this is the total accumulated dose, and if, as you keep exposing it, it, it stays more or less constant, but then at this sort of critical dose, it starts to drop. And in this case, it was the critical dose was nine electrons per square angstrom, and so this one I'm not sure what this does it say. It doesn't say where the I'm not sure what resolution this was at. But this is sort of how when you do what's called dose weighting of your of your um, regular pictures, they sort of use these sort of calibration curves to figure out how at what dose the various resolution points drop at. So how much dose you can. Get, you can give it to say, say get three angstrom resolution, which maybe you know not once you get say nine. If this is three, like, if this was a three angstrom resolution spot, you could give it up to nine electrons per angstrom squared of dose before it starts to really disappear. Whereas a lower resolution spot, maybe a twenty angstrom spot, you might be able to give it thirty electrons per square angstrom before it starts to disappear. And these these sort of curves are what's act, what was act, what's actually used now for for sort of our, our dose weighting of our micrographs. When we calculate dose weighted aligned micrographs or our single particle stuff, we want to see, we sort of want to downweight the, the later frames, uh, which have accumulated a lot of dose, to sort of downweight the later frames, which have uh, the high resolution parts of the later frames, whereas keeping the low resolution parts of the earlier frames. Um, but the point of this one is you, you can only, in, for these electron diffraction experiments, you can only give it a total, give the crystal a total dose of about nine electrons per square angstrom until it was sort of dead. Um, and then this this movie shows the sort of the data that they collected. Let's see if it will play. Um, so this is these are individual tilts, and the spots that they see are sort of are highlighted in blue. And so as you tilt it by one degree, the the position of the spots changes, and that's sort of you have it in the microscope and you're collecting diffraction patterns of it and you're tilting it and at each individual tilt you're collecting spots and it changes quite quite rapidly for you for, for a very small change um, this is looking at one particular spot if it was if it's changed even by 0.1 degrees it goes from kind of a half intensity spot to full intensity and then to half intensity again so it's very very the tech the, the collecting electron diffraction is very very sensitive to to um, the actual tilt of it and because of that, it's actually better to calculate to sort when you collect it to cal calculate it at a continuous rotation, rather than individual frames. So, so rather than doing like tomography, where you take a picture, tilt a little bit, take another picture, take a little bit, you, it's better to just have it continuously moving and have your camera continuously taking pictures. So taking a kind of continuous movie in order to to to, to do it. But you need a camera that can do that and. Generally, they have something called either a movie mode or a rolling shutter mode to, in order to do that. Um, so to set up your, your scope to collect diffraction patterns, you sort of, it's actually not 
very hard. All of them, every microscope you use has a little button that's called diffraction on it that you can see. Uh, generally, you're not, you're not pushing that button, but the, if you're in the nor sort of normal imaging mode, you have your sample up here. This is the electron beam coming, coming down the column and it's hitting the sample and it's, it's, it's hitting it and then it's scattering at some angle. Then it gets focused by the objective lens and then in the, the back focal plane, which is where the objective aperture is, you sort of get the sort of Fourier transform of the, of the image. That then gets focused down to the ima an imaging plane and then that gets sort of magnified by, by projection lenses onto the detector. So you actually see a real space image of your protein. This is kind of a simplified, of, or of your sample. This is a simplified schematic of what's happening in the microscope. So, so normally you do have a little object, you have a little objective aperture in here so that you're getting rid of the higher scattering points and that gives you a little bit more contrast than you would no otherwise normally get. Now, we, if you go on your microscope, there's a, if you hit that little diffraction button, you then, it changes the imaging mode so that um, basically what happens is instead of having a projection lens, it, it then turns on the diffraction lens. And so what the diffraction lens does is it sort of, focuses the, the back focal plane so that the, instead of seeing the image, instead of the imaging plane being onto the detector, the, the sort of image of the back focal plane is on the detector. So you now are seeing sort of the Fourier transform or the diffraction pattern of, of the image itself. And, and the re, there's a re, you don't normally press that button, especially when you're, I mean, if, when you're aligning it, you do, because when, you do, when you're aligning it, you can then see what's going on in, in the, in the um, back focal plane. And so you can use the diffraction image to sort of make sure that your objective aperture is centered. Um, but when you're, when normally when you're collecting diffraction images, you don't want any objective aperture in here at all because you sort of want to collect all of the highly scattered beam because that's where your higher, that's where all your high resolution spots are. Um, you also may, will insert a, a, what's called the selected area aperture and that, that's another aperture that goes in the imaging plane. So normally you don't have that in, but when you do insert this selected area aperture, instead of seeing sort of a wide field of view, it, it sort of limits it to a central point. So you might, have, you might only see six micron field of view instead of what, whatever the normal field of view is, say 12 microns at whatever magnification you're looking at. Um, but you, the, and the reason for that is you, you put in the selected area aperture so that you're only looking at the crystalline part of it and you're not looking at the outside part which isn't contributing at all to the diffraction pattern of that crystal. Um, and then at the bottom of it, there's a little thing here for the beam stop. So you, you, when you're doing diffraction imaging, you always insert a beam stop, again, to, to block out that strong central beam. Because if you image, if you take, it's okay to look at on the little phosphor screen to see that strong central beam. But if you take a, a CCD image or, a, or a, any sort of electronic image and you include that strong central beam, you're, you'll probably burn out your camera, uh, especially if, it, if it's a direct detector and you definitely will burn out your camera. Um, so you don't ever do that. So you insert the beam stop and then, and then you have your detector down here and you collect your, you can then use that to collect a diffraction pattern. Um, one other thing is the camera length can be changed. So um, unlike a, say an X-ray thing where there, there's a kind of a fixed distance between the detector and the, diffraction spot where you, you it's sort of defined where you, you know how far what the sort of where the say the one angstrom point lies it's going to be at, maybe it's at the edge of the detector in the case of the mic electron microscope because it's all of these lenses that that gets the diffraction pattern gets sort of magnified too and so you can change what's called the camera length in order to sort of see in order to get the right spots at the very edge I'll describe that a little bit later but that's why you sort of have a sort of a virtual detector instead of a, a you, the, you, it's collected on a physical detector, but the length isn't really defined. You have to calibrate what that link, what that detection length is. Um, so one advantage of collecting diffraction data and instead of uh, regular, you know, real space images is that it's not affected by a lot of the problems that, that sort of EM has suffered from all of these years. So it's not affected by stage ins instabilities or drift because you're only collecting a diffraction pattern and you're not collecting the phases, if the sample moves a little bit, the diffraction pattern doesn't change at all. The phases of it will, but you're not collecting the phases, so it doesn't matter, and the intensities will stay the same. So any of the problems that we, use, that we sort of suffer from, beam-induced specimen movement or charging, 
Um, unless the charging was really horrible, but just but say beam induced charging and movement of because of that, you're not suffering from that at all. Um, op various optical ab aberrations such as the CTF and the defocus um, and twofold astigmatism, um, and, uh, uh, um, the, the, the spherical aberration of the microscope, they don't, because you're not imaging, you're just collecting this diffraction pattern, they don't come into play really at all. You do have to ha make sure that there's no diffraction astigmatism, so you have to make sure that that diffraction pattern is not, is round and not oval. Um, other, you know, temperature instabilities. Um, but, the, but then it's, it does then become very analogous to an X-ray diffraction experiment where you're only intent, where you're only collecting the intensities and not and not phases. So you have to you then still have this the the phase problem when you do, when you do diffraction imaging. And this is an example. This was collected. I collected this just last year on the Joel 1230. If any of you have used the microscopes here, the 1230 is the lowest end microscope. It's a very good screening negative stain microscope. It operates at 80 kV. It has a tungsten filament, and this is this is a gold. Uh, this is a sample of sputtered gold, and the outer ring that you can just kind of see. I think this is it. This is at 1.2 angstrom resolution, which if you've ever used the 1230, it's kind of <laughs> you would not expect to be able to collect 1.2 angstrom resolution data because it's not it's it's because it's an old microscope and it's a very it's also an old camera. But you know it is possible even on that to get you know it is. In diffraction mode, you you still see all of this information, and like I said, on all the scopes, it's just this diffraction button to press. Now you do have to align the diffraction pretty well when you are collecting diffraction images. So the first thing you you have to align is you want you want to have the the center of the you know the bright peak the of the diffraction spot in the center of your image, and you want to have your beam stop centered on the um, on the actual diffraction spot as well. So in A and B, the center of the diffraction pattern is not in the center of the CCD. And so because of that, you would collect, you would be missing, if you collected images, diffraction images in either A or B, you'd be missing the high resolution data in some directions, which is not what you want. In C, the diffraction pattern is centered nicely on the camera, but the, the beam stop is not centered over the diffraction spot. And so you would very quickly ruin your camera in this sort of setup. And then in, in, in D is sort of the ideal setup where you have centered the diffraction spot and you've centered the beam stop over the diffraction spot. And this is how you definitely want to be collecting. And so that's, again, a little alignment that you do. You, when you're in diffraction mode, there's a diffraction shift where you can shift the position of the spot. And, that, and in a way, this is basically is why the collecting in diffraction mode is kind of dangerous always because if you don't have this beam stop always aligned with your diffraction spot, you will ruin your camera. And so you have to always be careful of that when you're doing it. Um, you also have to choose the and the, the the camera length of it. I just called it diffraction length here, but it's the camera length. So basically, like I was saying, you, there's not a defined position for on, on any microscope when you're in diffraction mode where these where these spots are. You have something instead of a magnification, you, you have what's called a camera length. So you're sort of changing the magnification of the diffraction pattern on the on the detector, and it, it calls that a camera length. So in this case, at, 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 at a four meter, 4,000 millimeter camera length, um, you have kind of low resolution. This is 10 extra resolution um, spots at the at the edge of your of your um, of your detector when you're when you're collecting it. So this would be no, sort of the the diffraction pattern is too highly magnified because you're sort of losing, you know, the five extra spots and the three extra spots. They would be all the way out here which is beyond the, the, the size of your detector. Um, in, the, in, in this case, the, in the, the 3,000 3, millimeter camera length, it's, it's kind of a, this is kind of more optimal. At, at the edge of it is, is three angstrom data, so that if you want to collect up to three angstrom resolution, you would want to use at, the, at least this. And then in C, this is le even less magnified. At the edge of it is only 1. Point, is only 1.5 angstroms. Now, if your data is only going to two angstrom, this would be sort of too low magnification because um, you can see that the, the sort of lower resolution spots are now being blocked by, by the beam stop, so you'd no longer be collecting the lower resolution spots, which, which may or may, depending on the, on, the, on the sort of structure factor or shape function of your protein, it could, could be bad, or your, your sample could be bad. Um, also, it may be harder to separate the spots at the high resolution because they're sort of really, really close together. Um, so you sort of, 
you, you first, when you're doing any sort of diffraction, you first of all have to define, have to figure out what these camera lengths correspond to in terms of what resolution can be collected. And so you generally just use a, a, a standard sample like a gold, a sputtered gold sample, which has a, where you know the lengths of the different, where the different um, dif diffraction spots will land, and then you can kind of calibrate your camera that way. Uh, and then you, and the, once you once you know that, you can then figure out what camera length you actually want to collect that. And this will be different on on every microscope. You also have to figure out when you're collecting diffraction spots um, how much you should collect. So it's very hard to tell sort of by eye, because you sort of only see a sort of a bright spot in the middle, and then you know kind of a smear of stuff on the outside. But if you're sort of if you sort of do a line integral along this diffraction image and then and then plot the intensity here like this um, in, in, the, in the case of a this is a little bit undersaturated um, I don't know if you can tell but this is a little bit more noisy at the top and it's not quite it's not it's not, it's not quite saturated whereas in, in B it's kind of you 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 expose it a little bit longer you're still getting a nice Gaussian curve and the, the sort of smoother, so you're getting closer to saturation, which is where you want to be. And then in C, you're exposing it too long, and you're actually oversaturating it. So instead of a nice Gaussian curve, you're sort of the peak gets sort of cut off. It, it's truncated because the, the the CCD can only collect so many counts. Um, you do you or whatever detector you use, it has, it does have to have a very high dynamic range, because the the, the spots at the, towards the, the the low resolution region will be very bright. And the spots in the high resolution will, will be very dim, and you want to be able to collect them both so that none of them are oversaturated. And for the dim spots, you want to you want your detector no, you want the spots to still be detectable above the noise level of, of the detector. So that that also is another thing you have to worry about when you're collecting diffraction images. Now, I guess when you're when you're sort of setting up for I, I sort of skipped this because, but um, what, I talked about the Ewald sphere a, a little bit a while ago. So this is an for, for X-ray beams. So this is the say a, a cartoon of the Ewald sphere. So you when you when you collect your diffraction pattern, you see these curves where you're, this is sort of what you're actually collecting at this particular view. At, for the for electron microscopes, a 200 kV. You're only, like I said, at two and a half picometer um, uh, wavelength of the electrons, and so because the wavelength is so small, the Ewald sphere is just about perfectly flat. It's not really perfectly flat, but it's very close to being perfectly flat. And so, sort of because of that, when you look at the diffract a single diffraction pattern, um, you you actually you don't sort of you don't see these sort of this sort of curved pattern, but they look almost perfectly straight. You actually are seeing really a more true representation of what the the true lattice is. Um, and this is kind of this is good for our imaging mode because because the Ewald sphere is so flat for for um, for, for for cryo for electron microscopy, we our assumption that when we collect real images, we're actually getting a true projection. It's like a true projection pattern of the image is more is very close to being true. Only when you're getting close to around two action resolution do you have to start worrying about the curvature of the Ewald sphere affecting your your structure. Um, if it was if it was like this, then we then our our images would be even more distorted when we collect them. But they're but not. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about it. For for um, when you're collecting diffraction images, though, especially when you're collecting these. When you're collecting um, different tilts of it, because of the flatness of the Ewald sphere, you're only sort of seeing. You're getting a different. You're not. You're. you're you, the software sort of assumes you can. You're collecting partial reflections of some and not and, and and whole ones of others, but because the sphere is so flat here, when you when you do this sort of tilt experiment, if you just if you just do sort of discrete tilting, you end up missing a lot of partial reflections. Um, like I said, when I, when, at, the, at the previous one, because it's basically because of the flatness of the sphere that uh, where's that picture? I have to find it. Um, that it's it's very sensitive to um, to the to to the tilting. So 
you, you could you can imagine that if you tilted it, this is a 0.1 degree tilt, and you could very easily, if you tilted it by half a degree, you would miss this spot altogether, because it sort of would not you would sort of it would not show up. So what because of that, you it's important when you're collecting it that you collect sort of a a continuous tilt, and so all of the images end up being sort of a a bit of a smear through through different um, through different through different tilts, and so that sort of helps fill in all of the data that you need to collect, and that also helps with with the indexing of the crystal. Um, so um, basically, the work the workflow overflow if you are the workflow overview of collecting micro ED is you. You set up crystals. Um, fortunately, I, the the screening isn't so. In a way, the setting up isn't so bad because I probably if you're doing micro ED, it's like you're you're sort of have a failed crystallography experiment. You haven't seen any crystals, right? So you've you've set up all these conditions, but you haven't been able to see any crystals. Maybe you just see, sort of see this dust. So what you would do is sort of put this sort of what looks like just dust or precipitate in your in your little drops. Put that on an EM grid and then screen that in negative stain and see if any of that dust is actually a crystal or not. And then if it is, it would be promising for, um, for, for, for sort of micro ED. So you, can, you would sort of do sort of low mag screening to see if you would have to, you would still have to make grids of all your conditions or all the conditions that you think might have crystals. But you would put it on, a, on an EM grid, screen for, see if you can see what looked like, what looked like crystals, collect a diffraction pattern of it and see if you see lattice spots. And if you do, you would then set things up in order to, to sort of collect a tilt series in diffraction mode of that crystal. So you would tilt it from minus 70 to 70 continuously, and then and then sort of collect a full diffraction series. So like I said, you'd sort of use a traditional setup for X-ray crystallography and look for cloudy drops. So the, the crystals have to be th at least thin in at least one dimension. They can be big in two of the dimensions, but the sort of practical limit for thickness is around 400 nanometers, so they have to be quite thin. Um, you would then do sort of sort of negative stain negative stain screening. Um, you, uh, side entry holder. If you have, only have a side entry holder microscope, large scale cryo screening could be difficult. But if you have an auto loader, a microscope with an auto loader, you could screen up to 12 grids at a time, which would help speed you up. But you, you have to then pay $20 a grid to clip it into the microscope, so nothing's free. Um, You'd then do sort of an initial screen at, at low mag and see if you can find good crystals, and then, uh, you know, you sort of find, see, when you see good crystals, you're you're kind of in good shape. Um, th so the reason the crystals can only be so thick is because of basically you, you get you get the few scattering. So you, you sort of you may have some the crystal may not be well ordered. Maybe that's why it only grows so tiny, and you also the thicker it is, the more inelastic scattering you're going to have or the multiple secondary scatterings you're going to have. And you sort of, all of the optics of everything, you know, all of the calculations assume there's only one scattering event and it's elastic. Um, if you have a, I guess if you have a microscope that has a, an energy filter, you could screen out the inelastic ones. So you might be able to go a little bit thicker. But um, generally, you want to be as small as possible. If they're sort of too big for micro ED, then you probably should be thinking about making them a little bit bigger so that you could, get, so that you could do x-ray diffraction. Um, on the other hand, if they are too big, um, there, there have been some papers where they just sort of broke them up, either by sonication or by pipetting or, or whatever, and then you could then take the little edge of a crystal that breaks off and look at it and, and, and do high resolution structures of it. Um, another, another thing you can do is if the crystals are too big in all the directions, but you still can't make them big enough for x-ray, and, and if you have the means to do it, you could do. You could use another microscope, which is called a focus ion beam scanning electron microscope, where you you use a focused ion beam to sort of thin your crystals. So this is this is how your the the crystal. In this case, they took a some large crystals, deposited it onto an EM grid, and then put it into a, a fib SEM microscope. This is a scanning electron microscope view of it of of the grid. So you see all of these. It always looks kind of like a 3D image, but you see the crystals sitting on the grid. And then this is looking at it using the ion beam, where you sort of have an oblique view of it. And then they've kind of centered in on this crystal. And then basically, here's the crystal at higher mag view, again, looking at it with the, with the ion beam. And then using kind of the ion beam in a slightly higher intensity to sort of blast away. You sort of blast away the top of the crystal and the bottom of the crystal. 
and leave a little thin lamella of crystal to sort of that you could then do diffraction of. Um, to me, it's kind of insanely complicated, but you you could do it. Um, it, it this is this. There will be another lecture on this in the course later, where you're using this for cells, and for cells, it, to me, make that's that that's the more commonly used thing, where you your cell is too thick for 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 EM because again, the EM it has to be thinner than say half a micron, so you then put it into a FibSem, blast away the top and bottom of the cell, and leave kind of just the middle bit, and then look at that by tomography. In this case, they're doing that technique for for crystals. And then um, this is the same, looking at it in the in the electron the SEM view, and then putting it into a cryos or something, and then looking at it by TEM, and then collected a, a tilt series of, of of that in diffraction mode, and they got it to two point seven. So that kind of was a proof of concept that blasting it with the uh, with the ion beam didn't destroy the high resolution structural information of the part that was left. Um, so the beam itself, when it when it shaves away your crystal or your parts of your crystal it's not damaging above and below the part of the crystal that you're that you care about and also your your early your observations of it using the ion beam and the electron beam are not destroying it as you're looking at it too um, so most data was that has been collected so far has been collected on a cmos camera in rolling so-called rolling shutter mode um, so the cmos cameras are the the newer generation of cameras that, that are a lot faster than the old CCD cameras. And they often have this mode where you sort of are live viewing it. So it's like, instead of shuttering the camera, it's continually rolling over, collecting, 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 until, and, and, so you can sort of collect kind of like a movie of, of, of images. Um, and in that case, the continuous readout of the parameters are disabled and it's sort of, things are just sort of set up to sort of continually collect. Um, so in, in the when you do process these, you also you, you have to define all of these things like where the beam center is, the rotation of the stage. Um, that if you collect using more using newer software, it might be easier now. But the old you know when you're collecting, if you're sort of doing it manually, you have to then you have to sort of calculate because you're sort of continually rotating the stage while you're collecting it. You you have to figure out for each frame of the movie what angle it was actually collected at. So maybe you know you are collecting at half a degree per second. So when you're five seconds in, you've, you've rotated at five degrees. And you know, how you, you know your frame rate. So you sort of have to have a little program to sort of roughly calculate that. And then that the, the software is sort of refined from there. And then you also have to know the, the sample to detector difference, which you've already calibrated using some sort of powder diffraction of gold or graphite. And then the, the generally the the, the movies you collect seem to have to be converted to this SMV format, which is which the X-ray softwares can, various pieces of X-ray software can read. They don't na none of the detectors naturally save into SMV format, but there are scripts available that will sort of do that for you. Um, so when you collect diffraction images, um, basically each image has to be collect is collected on extremely low dose. So you're usually at 0.01 to 0.05 electrons per square angstrom per second. So it's very, very low dose. You're sort of at, uh, if you were in imaging mode, you wouldn't see anything. But you were in your diffraction mode, you can see the spots. Um, the exposure times generally are maybe on roughly, on average, two to five seconds. And then ideally, you can collect minus 70 to plus 70. You may not be able to collect that high because the grid bars may get in the way. But that would be the ideal collection. Um, your, the goniom the sample of course has to be eccentric so that when it tilts it doesn't move and you have to have a very well aligned goniometer because you know even when you make it eccentric if your goniometer isn't very well aligned or isn't in very good shape if the tilt axis is far away from the optical axis it kind of swings this way like off of it and so then your your crystal would move out of the field of view as you tilt it because you're doing a continuous tilt you have no way to adjust it. So it, the, the scope and going on have to be in very well alignment. Your sample has to be thin, like I said, um, because also, also, you know, when you tilt it, it gets the, the parent thickness becomes bigger because it's got a kind of a slab geometry. Um, that'll be covered more in the tomography section, but you can kind of imagine that if you, you know, if my hand is this thick, then if I tilt it, it becomes this thick. So it, it becomes thicker. Um, you have to have a, a good camera that can do Sort of rolling shutter mode or, or movie mode, or or a, or, or a, you know you have to have a basically a camera that that will collect, let you sort of collect continuously. Um, 
So like I said, there's sort of two different modes of collection. The original mode was still images, but that, that was very difficult. I would, no one is really doing that anymore. Everyone is sort of collecting, anyone who's doing it is collecting continuously and then collecting movies of it in some way or other. Um, like, because it's an electron microscope, you, you can't collect 90 to 90, you can't collect a full 180 because when it's perfectly 90 degrees, it would be going through the side of the grid. Um, so the best you can do generally is minus 70 to 70. So you have kind of a missing wedge. So what you actually have to do is merge different data sets and you sort of have to merge different, collect different diffraction patterns of crystals. And hopefully they've all land, they've landed in different ways on the grid so that that way you kind of fill in Fourier space to sort of, so that you won't have such a large missing wedge and you can then get a full, a more complete data set. Um, as I said, th things have sort of advanced more um, since I originally was giving this lecture, uh, so, or since the tech and since the technique has been advanced, has was developed, um, I guess six years ago now, almost seven years ago. So now there are s techniques for automated collection. Um, that there's a collect. There's if you use Serial EM, um, Jason De La Cruz at, at MSKCC, he's developed this his own his set of scripts and he published them that, um, since 2019. Which can so you can collect micro ED in that using his scripts if you have the right camera. Um, his scripts, I believe, right now still only work on the Thermo Fisher microscopes, but I think it's in development for other other microscope brands. Um, I'll, another option, if you use the Legendon system, which is in use here, um, Anchi Cheng has got it working well in Legendon, and I think there there companies. He also works for Nanoscience Imaging is now doing this pretty routinely on 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 small first small molecule collection. So Legendon also has it. So it is getting to be, it's getting to be easier and easier to use, I would say. Um, as I said, the, the processing is a little bit complicated because you have to sort of define all these parameters. But once you have them all defined, you sort of use standard electron crystallography software. So um, um, dials, MOS film, XDS can be used for this. And I believe they all now have um, wavelengths, electron scattering factors as well as, well as x-ray scattering factors so that they're not, if you know how to do x-ray crystallography and someone gives you the data set, once you have the parameters, you could do it. Um, the indexing is a little bit more challenging uh, because of the, the Ewald sphere, but you sort of, because it, it kind of relies on that sphere to be able to have a, an idea of the 3D lattice, but it turns out if you give it, say, five to 10 images covering around 20 degrees, that gives you enough of of a starting point. And you can kind of throw errors into this, at least that one of the course I went to from Tamir, they sort of throw the errors into the mosaicity of the crystal, sort of it sort of throw all the garbage, uh, that sort of absorbs the errors of, of, your, of your collection so that it doesn't really, it works, so that the software actually works pretty well. Um, phasing, so like I said, the, when you collect diffraction data, you still have this phasing problem. And so for <clears throat> protein structures, just about all of them have been done using molecular replacement. Um, so you have to have a similar structure in order to get the phasing to work. Uh, for small molecules, ab initio phasing has been done. But there you need really high diffraction. It has to go better than 1.4 angstrom, and it should be small molecules. So for these small peptides and, 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 and drug molecules that I'll get into later, uh, ab initio phasing works pretty well. But for, for proteins, you pretty much, I think it's all been done by molecular replacement. Um, and then once you do process it, you sort of have a, an extended data table, which is basically the same as what, what you get for like x-ray crystallography. So it becomes very analogous to an x-ray crystallography experiment. Um, so its completeness can be a problem. Um, you have to have crystals that land in a different orientation. Um, again, to get into the detectors a little bit, uh, they have to have a high dynamic range and a fast readout and a low de sort of dead time so you can collect continuous images. So the original one that a lot of the work was done on was this TVIPS F416 camera. So it's a 4K by 4K CMOS camera with, with a scintillation layer, so it's not a direct detector, but it's got this phosphor layer. Um, in rolling shutter mode, it does 2K by 2K images, and that was good enough. Um, the, the, there's a CETA, the, the CETA detector that a lot of um, Thermo Fisher images, Thermo, Thermo Fisher microscopes come with can be used. They've since developed a CETA D detector, so D is for diffraction. So it's a, it's a four, both of them are 4K by 4K CMOS detectors. The D one has a thicker scintillation layer than the standard CETA camera, so it kind of gives it a higher dynamic range. 
um, so it doesn't get saturated as quickly. And then there are there are newer detectors, uh, these sort of hybrid detectors like the, the Medipix or the Dectris detector. These ones are very high speed, very high, highly hardened to radiation and have a high dynamic range. So they're really good that way. But the, they're probably, the only issue is they have a very large pixel size and they have a small number of pixels. So I think the largest one available is up to 1K by 1K. Uh, 512 by 512 I think is more common and the originals were 256 by 256. So they kind of can't really be used for standard imaging, but they're good for diffraction. So they, they sort of, these the companies that make these generally had been making um, detectors for x-ray for synchrotrons, and, and but now, you know, they see where the market is heading. So they're, they're sort of making detectors for EMs, for electron microscopes now for this sort of, for these diffraction experiments. Um, there, has, there was a paper just last year where they used a, a direct detector, a Falcon 3, to, to collect um, diffraction images. So that's a bit challenging. So first of all, um, you have to convince whoever has the microscope to let you do that, which should be very hard, I think. But you have to also, the, the, the camera itself is, has all of these software protections in it, so it won't normally let you take a picture in diffraction mode. The software just locks you out. So they had to get Thermo Fisher to disable the diffraction protection for that camera which I'm pretty sure invalidated their warranty or, you know, I'm sure if they burnt the hole in it, that'd be it for it. But it was actually a pretty good detector for this sort of thing. They could rotate at a fairly high degree, a fairly high rate. They rotated at 0.45 degrees per second versus they could only do, they could do 0.3 degree per second for the CETA. Um, and then this was also, I think that, I can't remember what the rotation rate for the um, TVIPS was, but it was quite a bit, it was slower than this even. Um, so they could also, they could, they could expose for only one, up to one second and kind of get the optimal point, whereas the CETA needed a bit longer exposure per frame. Um, they, they, oh yeah, here it is. The 416 needed four to five second exposure and only a 0 0.09 degree per second rotation rate. So the, the 416 camera was quite a bit, the, these direct, the direct detector was quite a bit better. But on the other hand, the direct detector wasn't that much better, I think, than the CETA. So, they, they sort of, as a, as a proof of concept, they did it. And they sort of, the, the sharpness of, the, of each diffraction spot was a little bit, was sharper on the Falcon than on the CETA. So it, it was a higher quality, but at a, a sort of a high risk of, the, of ruining the detector. Because if, I'm sure if you, if you hit a direct detector with, one of, with, a, un, with an unprotected diffraction image, you would, you would very quickly fry the detector. Um, like what might be the best solution if you really wanted to do it all the time would be getting one of these hybrid detectors. They have basically a small point, they have a really, they, have, they sort of have a nice, they have a small size, but, but they can take a, a pretty high dynamic range. So these are sort of made for that. Um, sort of finishing up, like the structure solved by microED, one, one issue is for the most part, they've already all been solved by other means. So a lot of it has been sort of proof of concept rather than new things. There was one, there was a, like, it came out last year, there was a structure where they found, an, where they did solve, solve a novel protein structure by, by electron diffraction. Uh, they used continuous rotation um, the method. They used um, kind of standard x-ray x -ray refinement, refinement software. These are what their crystals look like. So this is a, a light microscope image of the, of the drop. So this is all of the stuff that's in the drop. And then these tiny little triangles that, that are sort of pointed out are the crystals themselves. When they put it on the microscope, they looked like this, the nice little triangles. One, they were plate-like crystals, so it worked pretty well. So that was good in one hand. The thickness was always less than half a micron. But on the other hand, because they were sort of plate-like, they always had, they had a preferred orientation, so they almost always laid flat on the grid. Oops. Um, so this is what the diffraction pattern of, of one of them looked like. It's really quite nice. but when they look at the, if this is sort of the the reciprocal lattice in 3D space, the HKL indices, the colored image, the colored spots are the spots that they observed, and so the white spots are the spots that they didn't observe. So the completeness was pretty low. Uh, they were able to get around it by um, by by um, by the fact of the, the, the by the symmetry in the crystal, but the completeness after merging 21 sets only rose from 50% to 62%. Uh, but they did get a nice map. They got a, I think it was about a three angstrom map. Um, this is a sort of the, 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 the ribbon model of the protein and then a 
high uh, high mag view of two of the helices, so they have pretty nice, pretty well defined side chains, and it, it did work for them pretty well. Um, the microscope they used was kind of interesting. They used they used a Joel twenty one hundred, which is two hundred kilo kilovolt microscope. It did not have a FEG. It was a Lab six, so you don't really kind of in case you don't really need a FEG for this. Um, they used a small C two aperture. They sort of did their searching with this RAS detector, which is a, a low end um, detector from Gatan. And then they did their, 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 their diffraction collection on this TimePix hybrid pixel, det hybrid pixel detector. Um, and so this, this had a pretty, their diffraction distance was 18, 1830 millimeters. Um, and then, so finally, what's probably the best thing about this whole technique is and the sort of breakthrough of it was for, they sort of realized that this could work really well. F this technique that works for, has been proven to work for protein crystals actually could work for organic molecules. So if you have sort of purified an organic molecule or synthesized an organic molecule and it's in a powder support, you can kind of just put the powder on the grid and make, maybe make it grind it up so that it's small, small little things. And then you end up with these tiny little spots on the grid. Um, and you can, do, you can collect micro ED of these things. And it doesn't even have to be in cryo temperature. You could actually do it at room temperature. Or you could you know, just put on a room temperature grid and, and cool it in the microscope if you wanted to. But you don't have to worry about all of the freezing and stuff, and you can just do, do a direct structure of this directly. So this, in a way, is probably the most, will, will, will be one of the more common uses of this for these, for these sort of small molecules that someone that's chemist has just synthesized, and they want to know the structure of it. They could just stick it into a, an EM if they have it and collect micro ED reasonably easily or perhaps more easily than, a, than making a large crystal or crystal large enough for a, for a synchrotron. And it's, it's sort of a proof of concept paper, but it was done for a whole series of, of different organic molecules. And again, it's, sort of, it's basically the same technique as for, for protein crystals, except you don't have to crystallize it. You, have, you just take, take this powder of it, which is kind of naturally crystalline, and look for tiny little crystals that you can see. Um, so what do you need for microED? So for detectors, um, you don't want a CCD. Even if you have it, it's too old. Uh, the slow readout means no continuous collection. A CMOS detector with scintillation layer, uh, that's probably the ideal one. That's on, it's already installed on a lot of microscopes. If you have a, a Thermo Fisher microscope, um, they often have a CETA camera installed that may or may not be used very often. But that's kind of ideal for this. If you can get the C to D, that's even better because it's um, because it's uh, you know it's kind of made for diffraction, but the C to camera itself will work. Um, a direct detector you could use, but I don't think you'd probably be able to convince whoever is managing unless it's your microscope. No one's going to probably let you do it because you don't want to risk destroying your million-dollar detector uh, with it by collecting diffraction images. Or a hybrid detector would be. Another option, if you if you're really going into it and you want a dedicated microscope for for this, you know, uh, getting one of these detectors might be one of your better options. For the microscope, um, you 200 or 300 kV is good. You probably wouldn't want to use a lower end microscope. Um, the, basically, the lower the voltage, the thinner the crystal would have to be. So the higher voltage lets you go a little bit thicker. Um, just about all the experiments have been done on 200 or 300 kilovolt microscopes. In fact, the, the te technique was developed on a, first developed on a 200 kilovolt um, Techni F20. Um, I think of probably for a FEG is desirable, but it seems not to be essential. A Lab 6 is good enough. The goniometer is critical, so the goniometer has to be well aligned enough that you can actually have a continuous rotation and not have it move out of the field of view. So that, that is one of the critical hard things that you have to make, make sure the scope is good enough and that the engineer for your microscope aligns it well enough. If you're doing proteins, you need a stable cryo holder. Um, if, you're, if you're doing powder diffraction, you could do it at room temperature, I believe. And we've sort of done a few proof of concept things. Um, probably if you, do, if you collect it at cryo temperatures, you're going to protect it a little bit more from the beam. You'll have a little bit less slower rate of damage. Um, you might want to think about you know if you have your own microscope, custom selected area apertures so that you can kind of get the right field of view um, that you want instead of sort of the, the standard ones might aren't necessarily ideal for what you want. And then finally, if you're collecting protein crystals, you might want to get a slim beam stop. So 
the beam stop itself is, you know, the, the standard one is pretty thick, so you're blocking out a lot of the the area near the near the direct beam. Um, if it's thinner, then you can actually get closer to the direct beam. So that will be more important for proteins where you need the low resolution structure factor. For small molecules, you're not going to see anything there, so it's all going to be in high, the high resolution anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And then the, this is just, this will be, the, this is like a sample method if you wanted to try it. Um, this has been published in a couple of, pap of the papers where you can use proteinase K from Sigma and pretty easily get crystals to sort of start screening in case as a proof of concept. I would say, uh, you know, if you really want to get into this, um, I know that Tamir Gonin's lab has annual um, courses on it that you could apply for and go to UCLA um, and, and, you know, learn it for a week and then, you know, get, really get into the method if you really want to do it. Um, for future directions, I have a feeling, you know, if you, people really want to do it for proteins, they'll have to come up with other methods besides molecular replacement for it to work well. Um, probably though, there are always going to be improvement of detectors, probably larger hybrid detectors. These hybrid detectors may end up being more important anyway. Um, there's a kind of a push for high resolution at lower voltage so that you don't have to spend $5 million on a microscope, but if you could spend, you know, $800,000 and get a, real, a microscope that'll give you sub-angstrom resolution, that would be great. The current detectors won't really work for that, but these hybrid detectors might work for that if they can make them a little bit bigger. Um, so there is a bit of a there is a push for that. So that that will help both parts of it, the micro ED and sort of lower cost imaging. Um, I would certainly there's going to be improvements in collection software. It's improving everywhere, so it's going to improve there if more people do it. And it's possible fib milling will become more popular for th thicker crystals. But you know it's that's also I mean if it's too big for that maybe you want to really think about if you can do another technique. Um, so, so in summary, um, you know, you kind of the advantages of micro ED are you kind of only need mid-level equipment, not not the highest end. So, 200 kV CMOS detector. Um, the alignment is probably less difficult than for imaging mode. It's no longer dependent on everything being perfect, and the highest um, it it does for small molecules. It does actually have the highest resolution yet achieved by any cryo EM technique, um, sub angstrom. There, again, not, not a few papers of it, but still, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, this processing software is pretty much, since it's the standard x-ray processing software, it's pretty mature, and, and there's a large community of people who are using it. And the sample prep for small molecules is relatively simple, the, the powders. Um, disadvantages are, you know, the crystals have to be small and randomly oriented so that you can kind of fill in the Fourier space. I would say the sample prep and screening for protein is difficult. Not, it's getting back, it's not quite as difficult as it was for 2D, but it's not easy. You need a high quality stage, and then there's also, there's still the phasing problem. And uh, that's it, if you have any questions. You can, I know I kind of ran a little bit over, but. <laughs> and then at the end, there's a, I did, if, you, if you're into it, I have a full set of well, we'll slides <laughs> Yeah, the slides will be posted on the website. It might probably yeah. Or, I mean that that I think it can. It it might be that yeah. The the crystals they're, they're not very well ordered, but they're they're ordered well in, in small range. But over a large range, that it, it can't sort of keep that that order. So yeah, this, that's the sort of one thing you could have a crystal. If the crystals are sort of not good by X-ray, it might be if you looked at an edge of them or you broke them up by micro ED, they might be they might be good enough. I think, I think, in fact, I think one of the papers where they were breaking up the crystals, that was the case for some of them, where the, the, the whole crystal itself didn't diffract very well, but if you looked at a little piece of it, it was good. So it sort of had mosaicity or something to it. It, was just, it wasn't very well ordered overall, but the little pieces were. Is, is there a way to deal with missing information in 2D crystals? In 2D crystals? Uh, you still have to do this sort of tilting of it. Yeah, and, the, and you have the wedge problem, right? Yeah, you have the wedge problem. Um, you're not going to have a 90 degree view ever of it, so that will sort of always be missing. You sort of, you know, you'll, you'll collect crystals in different 
orientations around the tilt axis, so that will fill it in, so there'd be kind of a missing cone. Um, um, you might be able to, you know, think of some geometrical constraints that it's, you know, you know what part is missing, but you're sort of limited that way. I mean, the 2D crystals, I don't think there, there aren't many people doing it right now because it's kind of single particles working so well. <laughs> I mean, the, I think the advantage, with, the reason, it, you know, the 2D crystals work really well because it's sort of, the, the, the imaging techniques and the processing techniques weren't nearly as advanced for single particles, so you needed to have, by having a 2D crystal, you had the advantage of having everything just about ordered, and then you still had to do this sort of unbending, with, with, you know, fixing of the crystal deformations in 2D. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure the smallest. I don't. Would you know that the smallest crystal you can do? Well, you can go like how, how many micron? Mi well, it depends. So micro ED, you can do sub micron. So yeah, no, first of all, even micro focus beam lines, what the beam is. Uh, yeah, it's not. It also depends on the crystal dye. So some people choose longer crystals, like a few microns, and then they can go multiple areas on that seam because they might not get completeness. You might rotate the crystal nine degrees and it dies. Mm -hmm. um, but the smallest for a complete data set, I, I don't know. It has to be on the order yeah. of what the microfocus beam line is, which is what, still a, a couple microns, I think. Yeah, I mean, certainly is it, that's. I mean, there's certainly been a lot huge improvements on that end too. And for the, you know, for collecting synchrotron data, that's much more automated. So, I have, I have, a, I imagine that if you have crystals that are really small, you might want. You, Again, sometimes the strategy is to just try to make them a little larger somehow, <laughs> but but if it doesn't, I mean, this is a, a certainly a viable, it's been proven to be a viable technique. Okay. okay. There's no other further questions. Let's thank Bill and yeah. So they'll be on the, the slides will be on the website. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I can upload it right here if you want. Okay. Is there? Is there a? Is it on the? Do you, do you still have access to the SEMT website? Yes. Okay. You mean the? the what's it called? The. Um, The red mine, right? Would it be or red mine would work. Yes, uh, red you red could, yeah, because let me see if I can find the red mine. Oh, thank you. But if, 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 if you have a Slack on the computer, you can just...